Hi everybody, today we're going to be going over submarine fan depositional environments. So in this picture that we always show with the different depositional environments from source to sink, we have the submarine fans down here in the marine basin. And these are similar to alluvial fans, which we went over in the first video of the depositional system playlist. So if you want to know about fan deposition in general, you can watch the alluvial fan video. But in this video, we're going to be going over more specifically submarine fans and how they're different than alluvial fans, as well as their distinct characteristics in terms of preservation, said structures and stratigraphy. So one way submarine fans are different than alluvial fans is that a lot of submarine fans are long and thin rather than wide semicircles. This is likely because water can allow grains to remain suspended for longer periods of time and therefore stretch out the entire depositional system. Another thing that really gets the forward momentum going in terms of submarine fan deposition is the steepness of the slope that causes the deposition of submarine fans. Now, why are these slopes so steep? Well, these slopes start at the shelf edge, and the shelf edge marks the edge of the continent. And so after that, you have oceanic crust, and oceanic crust is very thin compared to continental crust. So you have this really big change in topography, which makes an environment similar to the adjacent to mountain environments that we find alluvial fans on in terrestrial settings. So what else controls the morphology and geometry of a submarine fan depositional system? Well, for example, one important factor would be how many sources are there. This goes for alluvial fans too. If it's a point source, meaning one channel feeding the alluvial fan, it's going to go from a really specific point and fan out, whereas if it's an entire slope that fails, it's going to be more of a slump feature, and therefore the morphology is greatly affected by whether it's a single point source submarine fan, which is shown in all three of the top images here, or it's a multiple point source submarine fan shown in the middle row of images, or if it's an entire higher slope failure, which is shown in the bottom row. And then the columns here just represent whether the system is mud rich on the left, sand rich in the middle, or gravel rich on the right. Now, in terms of these systems, we can already tell that there is a greater elongation in the systems where it's a single point source or multiple point source compared to an entire slope failure. And this is because in single point source systems, you have a more confined channel that allows for the traveling of the sediment over a longer area, whereas in the entire slope failure, you're not going to have one channel or a couple channels. It's going to be the entire slope that goes, and therefore it's going to expand over a wider but less long area. Additionally, as we move to the right, we can see that the greater the size of the grains, the wider and shorter the system becomes as well. And this is because coarser grains will deposit first. Mud and silt-sized grains will obviously be able to stay in suspension for longer and travel further outward. So the two or three-ish types of submarine fans that are typically what is being referred to in the case of, for example, this lecture when I say submarine fan is shown in the upper left corner of this figure. So typically a more muddy or sandy environment because gravel submarine fans are not that common and typically a more point source or multiple point source system rather than a slope failure because a point source is necessary when we're talking about a fan morphology. You have to have that one point for setting to go down to actually fan out once it deposits its sediments. If it's an entire slope, you're not really going to get that fan morphology. So we're probably going to be focusing on that upper left corner more so than the bottom right settings shown in this figure. So to zoom in on a submarine fan type system a little bit more, what we have here is the shelf, then the shelf edge, then the slope, then the basin floor. And what we have going through the shelf edge, the slope, and then to the basin floor is what's called an inside canyon. And this canyon is what feeds the submarine fan. You have sediment that feeds through those canyons and then down to the basin floor where it fans out forming submarine fans. So here's another image of what the system can look like and what we have is a river feeding deltaic sediment to the shelf and then sediment further out down the canyon and down to the abyssal fan, in this case a submarine fan. And what you'll see in succession from further inshore to further off 
offshore is the slope with the canyon in it. And then you'll have first debris flow and channel deposits. And then later in the more distal part of the system, you'll have turbidity flow deposits or turbidites or depositional lobes at the end of the channels with turbidites at the distal part of those lobes. And we'll talk about what turbidite means later. But first we'll go through what kind of the stratigraphy is in each main part of the system. We have the slope of the canyon where slump features may be present with coarser grain deposits in the canyon and nothing really depositing necessarily on the slope itself. And then you have debris flows which have cohesive plastic flows which are laminar. And because debris flows are laminar, remember they don't sort grains. So debris flow deposits or debrites are commonly composed of coarse unsorted sand and gravel in elongate lobe structures. And then you have confined channel deposits. If there is a channel that forms down on the basin floor, you'll have the canyon feed that channel and then deposition in that channel will be most likely lateral accretion along inner bends like point bar deposits, which we talked about in the fluvial depot environment video. Check that out if you haven't seen it. Additionally, you'll have steep cut banks and a levee deposition on the outer bends. And then you'll have ichnophases present in these deposits as well. And this is important to point out because if you're looking at a point bar deposit and clearly you know it's some sort of fluvial channel deposit, how do you know whether it's a subaerial system or subaqueous system? Well, if you see marine ichnophases, then that's when you know it's a subaqueous system. And so ichnophases are important when it comes to determining whether it's subaqueous or subaerial. Moving on to turbidites, we have turbidity flows that occur at the distal end of submarine fans and in crevasse play deposits from the submarine channels shown in the figure on the right and also at the distal edges of the depositional lobes also shown here in the figure on the right and then the depositional lobes themselves terminate each submarine channel and are composed typically in the bulk of their deposits of unsorted sand and so we've heard this word quite a bit we've heard turbidites or turbidity currents turbidity flows etc so what are turbidites what are turbidity currents well turbidity currents are underwater currents flowing swiftly down slope because of the weight of the sediment that they carry and the weight of the sediment that they carry means that they have a high suspended sediment load which means they're very dense which means they're hyperpycnal flows if you don't remember what a hyperpycnal flow is i talk about it in the delta and lacustrine video but basically a hyperpycnal flow is when the inflow to a basin is denser than the basin water that it's flowing into and what these hyperpycnal flows cause is turbidity currents additionally this high suspended sediment load in the turbidity flows is why they're named turbidity currents and this is because turbid describes something with a high suspended load in a fluid, any fluid. And so if you have a lot of suspended mud or anything in this water, then it's obviously turbid. And so that's why they're called turbidity currents. They're not called turbidity currents because they're turbulent. They are turbulent, but that's not why they're called turbidity currents. I'm only saying all this because I swear I thought that for the longest time they were called turbidity currents because of their turbulence, but that's not true. <laughs> turbidity is completely different than turbulent. So here's a picture and a video of a turbidity current. We see this hyperpycnal flow hugging the bottom of that basin floor or what passes for a basin floor in a lab, and what we see is it's pluming sediment load that plumes up and then later settles down really slowly. This is what will cause the distinctive stratigraphy that comes along with turbidity flows. And these are called turbidites, and we'll talk about their stratigraphy a little bit later, but they're very distinctive and they help us to determine what we're looking at in the rock record, if we're looking at a submarine fan or not. But before we get to that, we have to understand that turbidity currents are not the only thing that occur in these hyperpycnal flows that cause submarine fan deposition. They're the most distal part of these systems. First, First, there is sliding, then slumping, then debris flows, then turbidity currents. So this is kind of the order of deep water gravity driven deposition processes that occurs before turbidity currents. But because turbidity currents cause such a distinct stratigraphic signature, we will focus mostly on their sedimentary structures and stratigraphy. So what these really distinct sequences are called is BOMA sequences. They're called BOMA sequences because some guy named BOMA came along 
along and figured out what these were and characterized them. And they have a very consistent pattern. This pattern goes from what we call TA to TE. So TA, if we look down at the strat column at the bottom right figure, contains sands and gravels and shows graded bedding and is deposited first during the turbidity flow. And then TB is deposited next and it contains sand with planar lamination. And then you have TC depositing next and TC contains medium sand grains with trough cross bedding and ripples as you move up section. And then you have TD, which is getting even finer with fine sand and mud. And this exhibits planar lamination. And then you have the deep basin muds. And we can see that in this strat column, they went so far as to tell us how long it takes for each one of these sequences to deposit. We can see TA, it says deposits in minutes. This is because it's pretty coarse grains that just want to settle down to the basin floor. Then we have TB depositing in minutes as well. And this is because it's still pretty coarse. And then we have TC taking a little bit longer to deposit, takes hours for TC to deposit fully. And then you have TD depositing in hours as well. And then TE. TE is the deep basin muds. Mud grains take forever to settle out of suspension. And you can see it says here, deposits in months to years even. And so that's pretty crazy to think about, but it gives you an idea of how long these sediment plumes may stay as plumes in the water. So now if we look at the left image where we actually have the fan shown in this figure, where we have the feeder canyon, then the coarsest sediment depositing first in that bright orange region, then the finer sands depositing second in the lightest brown region, and then the darker browns getting finer and finer as it deposits further and further out base and word. And this is because the sediment grains that want to stay in suspension, the really fine ones, will travel further. And this is why the Boma sequence has a finding upward succession. But keep in mind that the Boma sequence is the idealized stratigraphy for turbidity currents. What commonly can happen is that you get a bunch of amalgamated A layers of different turbidity flows because that layer typically preserves most often over the others. So we can see this in the bottom right figure now. We see these layers of graded bedding with gravelly and sandy deposits. We can kind of make out a TA and a TB, but we can't really make out C, D, or E. And this is because those are more easily eroded away by the next current. Additionally, this makes it difficult when it comes to deciding how many events we're looking at when we see BOMA sequences in the rock record, because most of the time they're incomplete sequences. So how many events would that be? And maybe we see part of one and part of another. Maybe we see a TA and then we see a TE on top of it, but there is an unconformity in between. Is that part of the same flow or two different flows? So this is when it becomes difficult to decide how many events or turbidity flows you're actually looking at. And this is something that you have to take into consideration, a lot of other factors probably, to actually get to the bottom of, or something that you may not actually figure out, which is unfortunate, but it's just how geology is. We don't have a perfect record. We just have what we have, and we have to work with it. Additionally, as we already mentioned, debris flows are laminar, so they do not sort grains or grade. And we can see, even in the first section, the TA section of BOMA sequences, that there's already grading and sorting going on. And so when we see BOMA sequences or even parts of BOMA sequences in the rock record, we can pretty much know that we're looking at a more distal part of a submarine fan system rather than the more proximal debris flow part, which would be less sorted. And another indication of being in the more distal part of the system is sedimentary structures that indicate waning flow. These can include the finding upward succession as well as climbing ripples. Climbing ripples are a good indication of waning flow. And we can see in this outcrop, we have a pretty nice section of a BOMA sequence. They nicely labeled for us the T, B, C, D, and E sections of this outcrop. And we can see that in the B section, we've got the more sandy, planar laminated section. And then we move up to the rippled section. And then we have another planar laminated section. And then we have a finer, more muddy section. Here's another real life example of a preserved turbidite or BOMA sequence. We have here at least a little bit of TA with some coarser sand grains and maybe a little bit of gravel exhibiting normal grading. And then we have TB with a little bit of finer grains and they exhibit planar bedding. And then we have the beautiful climbing ripples in this section. And then they have this TD and E section up at the top, but I don't know how much you could trust that unless you're there looking at the rock yourself. But basically we have a beautiful TA, TB, and TC in this section. And lastly, 
I wanted to include one example of what I said was actually most common, which is a TA sequence. And this is because the ones that I have shown you, although beautiful with wonderful TC sections with textbook climbing ripples, those may be great and pretty and just tell you exactly what you're looking at, but those aren't common. And so I wanted to bring us back to real life and show what is actually more common to see in terms of a BOMA sequence in the rock record, which is just TA, which is the graded bedding of the gravelly and sandy sediment at the beginning of the sequence. Now, luckily, there aren't that many different depositional environments that also cause normal grading. And so you could narrow it down quite a bit with just the TA sequences, but it's much, much easier to be certain of what you're looking at if you have the adjacent facies along with your TA sequence. So I hope that was helpful in terms of learning about the distinctive stratigraphy that is caused by turbidity currents. And if you want to know more about debris flow stratigraphy and fan depositional environments in general, you can check out the alluvial fan depositional environment video to learn more about that. Now I'm just going to re-show you guys this figure again where we see all the depot environments going from source to sink and just reiterate what we've gone over so far and point out what is to come. So we have gone over alluvial fans, fluvial environments, lacustrine environments, shore face environments, deltaic environments, submarine fan environments, and next video we'll have estuarine environments, and then eolian environments, and then glacial environments. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you look forward to coming back to watch the rest of the videos I just mentioned. And if you want to watch them all in the order that I intended them to be listened to, then you can go ahead and just click the playlist down below, which is the depositional systems playlist, and you can watch them all in order. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Hi, everyone. <gasps> <laughs> okay.